Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Module 4. Now, so far, you see, I've been trying to describe to you these spin related phenomena that have been observed using magnetic contacts. And I said that much of this you could understand just by assuming that, you know, you have this non magnetic channel with a red channel and a blue channel which are identical and which are contacted by the two magnets and the magnets happen to have different interface resistances to the two channels. So the red channel, if the magnet is pointing upwards, then has a relatively low resistance interface, the small r, while if the magnet is pointing downwards, has a high resistance interface, the big r. And in terms of this model, one can understand a lot of the things that we, that have been experimentally observed. Um, but the point I didn't get into so far was like why is the interface resistance depend, why does this interface resistance depend on the direction of the magnet relative to the spin? What do spins have to do with magnets? And that is the point I'd like to stress, uh, talk about in this module. Well, you know, one of the things we had done back in the first week, I believe, is that when I said that, well, whenever you want to understand any device, you know, you have a channel and you have certain, and you have these contacts. One of the first things you should do is to draw the density of states. That is what available, what energy levels are available for conduction. And the picture I drew a lot of in weeks one through three looked something like this. The one that we haven't drawn so far this week. See, it looked something like this. There was this energy axis and we draw a density of states. You see? So this axis being the density of states. Now, if you want to draw a similar diagram now, you know, it would be the, much the same. This is a non-magnetic channel, so nothing has changed really. But let me draw kind of two density of states here, one for the red channel and one for the blue channel, which is also identical, you see? So let me just draw that also here. So that I've got this density of states kind of, so the density of states for the red channel kind of points in the right, to the right, whereas this one points to the left in the sense that this is a negative of that at all. I could have just drawn this over on this side. Only reason I'm drawing it here is so the two are separated and you can see it clearly. That's all. Right? So we have a red channel with some density of states and a blue channel with some density of states. Well, what about the contacts? Well, that's where, of course, things have changed significantly from weeks one through three. What has happened is that you now have a contact here, and when you draw the density of states for the contact, it looks something like this. If you looked at the red channel, so let's say this is a magnet that points upwards, then if you had looked for the density of states for upspin electrons inside this magnet, it would, it would look more like, say, something like this. Whereas, if you looked at the density of states for the blue channel, it would have, might have looked something like this. In other words, they are not the same. This is the difference between a magnet and a non-magnetic channel. You see, this is a magnetic contact, that's a non-magnetic channel. Non-magnetic means both spins exactly the same. Basically, whatever you have for one, you have for the other. Two things, just identical things in parallel. But in the magnet, they are different. You see? And if you looked at, if I now draw the electrochemical potential, it would be, say, somewhere here. And what it means is, when it comes to the red channel, you see, let's say I've got a red electron here. 
which is trying to get out into this contact. What it sees is lots of states to get out into. And because there are lots of states to get out, the corresponding resistance is lower. So it gets out easily, current flows much more easily. On the other hand, when you have a blue electron trying to get out, that's when it sees that far fewer states are available, not quite as much as that one. And so it is harder to get out, and so correspondingly, the resistance is higher. And this is exactly what we tried to capture here in this circuit model that we have been using in the first three modules this week. That is a small r and a big r. That the one represents what you see when you are trying to, the small r corresponds to a situation like this where you have a lots of states to get out into. Getting out is easy, low resistance. And then there is the other case when you have very few states to get out and so the resistance is high. Now I'll come back to this point a little later, I guess in this module itself I'll come back to it. But let me try to explain a little further then why is it that in a magnet this looks, you know, the red and the blue are so different. You see because what does the magnet have to do with the electronic spins? Okay. And this is where the basic point to note is that it is as if every electron is really like a magnet. I mean, that's a, that's a statement that needs to be qualified and actually I think I'll say a little more about it in the last module. We'll try to get this, you know, qualify it and get it a little more precise. But for the moment, I think yeah, let's go with a slightly imprecise statement, but that every electron is essentially a magnet. How do you know this? Well, that, that's where we go back to the stern gerlach experiment, you know, back in the, I guess, early 1920s, where the idea was that you have a region where there is a magnetic field that is inhomogeneous, this is B field. Inhomogeneous means it is spatially varying. Now what is known, what was known already then, was that if you had little magnets, in a region with an inhomogeneous magnetic field, then the magnets want to bend in that direction. So if the magnet happens to be pointing in the direction of the field, it would bend one way. If the magnet happens to be opposite, oppositely pointing, it would bend the other way. And the thing is that when people did this experiment with electrons, they found that half the electrons bent this way. So on the screen, they left a spot somewhere up here. And the other half bent this way. And on the screen left a spot somewhere here. So here were these electrons. Actually, these experiments are done with, not with electrons, but with neutral atoms. And the reason is, that if you take a charged particle, then there is usually often a large effect due to any electric field. So it's better to do, the, do it with neutral particles. So you usually do it with neutral atoms. And the original experiment was done with silver atoms by Stern and Gerlach. But in a few years, people did it with hydrogen atoms also, you know, where it's the simplest thing you can imagine. Hydrogen atom, this every atom has just one electron and a positive charge, a proton. But the, and what was seen is, Indeed, half the atoms would bend one way, the other half would bend the other way, and you'd give you these two spots. And it's believed this is because, you see, every electron is like a little magnet, and if the magnet is in the direction of the B field, it bends one way, if it's in the opposite to that direction, it's the other way. And from how much it bends, here, you see, by measuring this, how much it bends, you could tell what is the magnetic moment of that magnet? You see, usually mag magnetic moment is measured by, or rather the strength of a magnet is measured by this magnetic moment, which you could think of something like this. That if you had a little current loop, a current going round in a little closed loop like this, then the magnetic moment is, you know, there is a magnetic field due to that current, and the magnetic moment of this loop is given by this current times the area. 
So it would be something like, in MKS units, would be something like amperes square meter. Now, when you looked at the electron, just from how much it bends, you could tell what the strength of that magnetic moment is, and, the, and this quantity, that's what is known as the Bohr magneton, mu, written as mu sub b. You know, nothing to do with chemical potentials or what we denoted mu with. This is the Bohr magneton, it represents, it tells you, you know, how strong a magnet each electron is. This is one electron is like a little magnet whose strength is that much. And this quantity is given by this Q H bar over 2 M. Actually, it says almost this. You see, the correct exact expression would be, one should write it as this times G over 2. Well, this G is what is called the G factor, and for electrons in vacuum, that's almost 2. It's like 2.00 something. So basically, for our purpose, we can just take that thing as 1, essentially, and that's why we don't need to write it. But one thing to remember is, sometimes when you, have, when you are talking about electrons in solids, the G factor could be very different from 2. Because, as you know, electron ordinarily has a certain mass. But once you talk about electrons in a solid, it can behave as if it has a different mass. Similarly, electron in a solid can behave as if it has a different G factor too. So many times it's close to 2, but not necessarily. But this is a factor I won't be writing here, but something to remember. But So the basic thing is that the electron ha is like a magnet whose magnetic moment is this. And if you put in those numbers, it comes to approximately 10 to the power minus 23 ampere square meter. So that's the value of that. So if you wanted to visualize it as a little current loop, you could say that, well, it's maybe about a milliamp in a little loop which is 10 to the minus 10th meters on the side for example. Of course, nothing special about those numbers. I could have used a smaller current and made this size a little bigger. All I'm saying is one milliamp in a little loop like this would give you about the same kind of a magnetic moment, if you want to think about it that way. And that's kind of the origin of this name spin. It is as if this electron is turning, as if it's spinning, giving rise to some kind of a current, and that's why there is a magnetic moment associated with it. But of course, the thing I always stress is with all these pictures that finally, how do we know this? Well, it's because of, again, stern girlack experiment. If in science and engineering, things that you have confidence in is usually always based on some key experiments which give you the facts. Everything else is kind of a way of understanding those facts within a certain framework. So the basic fact here is electrons behave like little magnets whose strength is about that much. Okay. Now, why are most materials non-magnetic? You know, every electron is a magnet. So why is it it's not ordinarily non-magnetic? Well, because you got millions of electrons which are all randomly pointing in different directions. So overall, there is no net, magne net magnetic direction to it. It's got just all random. That's what you ordinarily have when you think of a non-magnetic channel. So you have lots of electrons here, reds, blues, all mixed up. So overall, there is no magnetization. That's a non-magnetic channel. On the other hand, there are certain special things called magnets, where indeed these spins because of certain internal forces, which course, is a subject in itself, this whole theory of magnetism, why certain solids behave like magnets. But in these solids then, it is as if there are internal forces which causes all these electrons to line up together. And this you see actually not just in solids, but even in the atom itself. So for example, if you take iron atom, like in iron, there are these 6d electrons. As you know, there can be 10 
d electrons of to total of 10, but there are 6 d electrons of which, you know, there's this 10 states, 5 of them are up, 5 of them are down. And these 6 kind of try to arrange themselves so that most of them, these 6, so that most of them are in the same direction. So overall, even an iron atom tends to have the spins lined up rather than be take this 6 and just be half and half. So these are lined up so that the, even an iron atom has a net magnet, magnetic moment. And then in a solid, of course, it also has a magnet. I mean, this is the standard magnet that we know of, right? Iron is what we think of when we say magnet. But the point I'm trying to make here is that every electron is basically a magnet, but then most things are non-magnetic because it's random. But then there are materials like iron where a lot of the spins want to line up. And when they want to line up, that's when you have a net magnet and something that looks like a magnet. And in that magnet then, up spins and down spins can have very different energy level, energy states. Why? Because inside you have got all these magnets that are lined up. It is almost as if you have put a magnetic field inside due to all these other things. And so as a result, it is like one type of electron, the red electrons and the blue electrons have very different energies. But one thing I should stress is that this interaction that kind of makes spins line up, that itself is a rather mysterious interaction in the sense that if you just take the laws of electromagnetics and you know how one magnet, what force one magnet exerts on another, you know, just from our everyday experience. And if you use that, then that force would have been far too small to explain what is observed. The actual forces are much, much bigger and it's generally what is referred to as this exchange forces. And just to give you an idea, you see, when you look at these magnets, the blue energies and the red energies are often separated by like one electron volt, one or two electron volts. And if you had tried to create, you see, in an ordinary non-magnetic material, if you had put a magnetic field, and you are tried to give one type more energy than the other, and let's say you try to split it a little bit, you can do that, but usually with ordinary magnetic fields, you'd get a splitting that is much less, you know, definitely not electron volts. It would be more like milli electron volts. To get electron volts, you'd need enormous magnetic fields. And in a way, one could say that in a magnet, the electrons feel these exchange fields that are so that are really extremely large, which is why the magnets are stable even at room temperature. And I think in Feynman lectures, there is an article, there is a lecture, I believe in volume two, where he explains this point. He shows that what kind of an interaction would be required to make magnets be stable at room temperature and it shows that it has to be much larger than what you'd expect from the ordinary magnetic forces. But that's a whole different subject that we are not getting into. The main point I wanted to make here is just that magnets and spins are essentially the same kind of thing, what I mean. And although, as I say, 10, 20 years ago, these were two very different fields. There was this field of spintronics where people would try to create excess spins in semiconductors or metals and try to manipulate them. And then there was this field of magnetics because magnets, of course, have been known a long time and are very useful things with their own applications. And what has happened is in the last 10, 20 years, people have learned to make nanomagnets, magnets that are kind of small. And once you make magnets small, the difference with spins kind of becomes gradually sort of vanishes. That is when you have a magnet with a thousand spins in it, it is, behaves a little bit like spins itself. And one of the things I'll talk about in the next module is how, you see, if you wanted to switch a magnet, like a magnet is pointing up and you want to turn it down, usually what you'd have to do is apply a magnetic field. But what is now established is this effect called the spin torque, where you can turn a magnet 
simply by throwing spins at it. That if you throw a lot of excess spins pointing the other way at it, it will, it can actually turn the magnet. And this is again something that is, that people are trying to use for many practical devices. And so, what has happened in the last few years then is that this distinction between spintronics and magnetics is gradually disappearing and it is becoming sort of one big field.